Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a good friend of Senator Kennedy and of all of ours, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thank you very much, Paul. Vicky and all the children and I uh John used to regale us like that all the time at lunch in the Senate dining room. And uh John's acting like uh Teddy always took advantage of him. You should have seen it when they both teamed up on somebody else. <laughs> John, I remember we were talking about Angola once and you and Teddy were working out a deal with uh, some of our more conservative friends, and you agreed on a particular course of action. And I was along with your colleague, Dick Clark, you and Dick and Teddy, myself, and Teddy's office. And uh, being naive as I was as a young senator, we started about how we were going to approach this issue on the floor, and Teddy said, we got to do this. And I said, but, I, I said, but that's not what we said. We told these guys we were going to do that. And Teddy very politely, Teddy Jr., tried to say to me, well, no, we're going to... And uh, this went on for a few minutes, and finally, John, in a roaring voice, stood up and said, Biden, what the hell do you think this is, boy state? <laughs> that was my introduction to the squeeze of Kennedy and Culver. What the hell do you think this is, boy state? You know, I, I know we're all here today to celebrate celebrate the life of an incredible man. But I want to first say to the whole Kennedy clan, I want to give thanks. Thanks uh, for your father. Thanks for your husband. Thanks for your uncle. Thanks for your brother, who uh, in an astonishingly and totally unexpected way ended up playing an important part in every critical moment of my adult life. It was literally an accident of history. But he had, uh, he crept into my heart, and before I knew it, uh, he owned a piece of it. Today, uh, I was thinking about how uh, Teddy was, uh, I wouldn't be standing here were it not for Teddy Kennedy. I wouldn't be standing here as Vice President of the United States. I wouldn't have been a United States Senator were it not for Teddy Kennedy. For uh, He was the catalyst for my improbable win as a 29-year-old kid running for the Senate in a year when Senator McGovern only got 34, 35 percent of the vote in my state. And I was running against a fellow who, uh, who was extremely popular, an incumbent senator, and uh, Although it surprised the hell out of people, and we came, we were coming astonishingly close. Uh, we needed something else, and out of the blue, literally, about uh, eight days before the election, Teddy Kennedy showed up. And he showed up in a neighborhood that uh, we refer to as Little Litley in Wilmington, Delaware, um, and drew a crowd. It was a, actually a dinner uh, of a couple thousand people. And uh, uh, a community that would vote nationally for the Democrats, but on all the statewide offices, always voted Republican, including for the Senate and the House seats. Uh, I ended up winning that uh, neighborhood. I ended up winning the election by 21, excuse me, 3,100 votes. And although I don't know for certain, it seems highly unlikely, Congressman, I would have ever won uh, were it not for your father energizing people the way he did at the very end. I remember what he said. He stood there and he ended the speech by saying, I only have one problem with Joe Biden. I think he's a little too young to be a senator. <laughs> and literally, the next day, the Wall Street Journal played it straight. Kennedy says Biden too young for the United States Senate. But seven weeks later, when my wife and daughter were killed in an automobile accident, and my two boys were very badly injured and hospitalized, one of whom was with me here today, Hunter, the other is in Iraq. 
Um, I, uh, I got a call from your dad. And um, I didn't know your dad too well. I mean, I just met him that one time. And here I was, an Irish Catholic kid from uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, who only thought of uh, Teddy Kennedy and the entire Kennedy family in sort of a distant terms, hushed tones. And uh, here he was on the phone. And he not only was on the phone, but he called me in that hospital almost every day. And about every other day, I turned around, literally, Vicky, there was another specialist from Boston, Massachusetts, one of your great hospitals, sitting next to me, who I never asked for and didn't know I needed, but I needed. He was the prod who convinced me to, um, to go to the Senate, because I had told my governor after that election, the governor-elect, to be precise, my brother did, that we were going to appoint someone else. I didn't want to go to the Senate. And it was your brother who came to see me to tell me that I owed it to my deceased wife and my children, at least to be sworn in and stay for at least six months. Uh, and when I got to the Senate, um, he would literally come by once or twice a week uh, to my office in the middle of the afternoon, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to get the hell home. I didn't want to be around. And uh, John, he took me for the first time I ever went to the Senate gym. He'd come by and he'd take me to the Senate gym. I'll never forget the first time he took me. I had met any of these famous players. I got sworn in late compared to the other senators. And I'll never forget walking into the Senate gym and him introducing me to uh, Senator Jack Javits and uh, Warren Magnuson, both of whom were stark naked when I met them. And I remembered, oh my God, Senator, how are you? I, uh, I, uh, but he never, uh, he sort of took on the role of, uh, of being my older brother. He just, he just was there all the time, and I never asked. And I never could really understand, to tell you the truth at first. I didn't understand why he was going out of his way for me this way. He, uh, he got me on the committees that I ended up chairing. He, uh, and uh, he was sort of my tutor, sort of exposing this kid from Scranton, uh, to a world that I had never seen and didn't fully understand. I used to go home every night in the beginning. I went home every night for 36 years, but I went home every night as soon as scent was out. And I never once accepted any invitation in Washington to not out of the desire not to be in Washington. I just wanted to get home. <laughs> After one afternoon, Teddy came to my office and said, Joe, look, I got to give you a piece of advice. He said, uh, this is, I got a call from Pamela Harriman. This is the fourth invitation you've gotten from Governor Harriman to come to one of his dinners. Now, I didn't know enough to know that that was a big deal. I really didn't. I honestly got it didn't. And he said, Joe, you've got to go. You've got to go. It just doesn't look good. I'll go with you. And I'll never forget going into Avril Harriman's home in Georgetown and sitting, uh, and uh, he was sitting in a, in a, armchair, excuse me, a wing chair. I was on the couch next to the chair nearest Abraham Harriman. Teddy was next to me. Henry Kissinger was across from me and Paul Warnke, both arms control experts. And I was uh, this 30 year old kid. Uh, and uh, Abraham Harriman had a way of sort of uh, um, trying to include everybody in the conversation. And we're talking about a complicated arms control agreement. It used to be the SALT agreement. And, and this discussion was going on. And all of a sudden, our Avril Harriman looked at me and said, Well, Joe, what do the young people think about this? <laughs> I didn't know what to tell to say, John. I was scared to death. I didn't want to make a fool of me. Here I was, a United States senator. So I reached over and picked an object up off the coffee table. And I was nervous, and I was flipping it back and forth in my hands like this as I answered the question. And I noticed everyone stiffened up when I was talking. 
And the, uh, the butler came in and said, time for dinner, and everybody immediately got up and bolted for the dinner table. And your dad grabbed my arm and he said, God damn it, put that thing down. He said, that costs more than your house. <laughs> I was flipping a Fabergé egg in my hands. So the sophisticated kid from Delaware, uh, it seemed like every single thing I did, he was there.